So we are all good. Um, so you all should have just gotten a notice that the meeting will be recorded, um, which it will. So you'll be able to reference it back later. Um, additionally, we always share our resources with folks afterwards. Um, so you'll get a follow-up email from us with our PowerPoint slides, any other resources that we share, um, and anything else that comes up during our conversation today. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with uh, our workshop today on compassionate responses, utilizing calling in to address challenging comments. Um, so my name is Matt Kreit, uh, that name on the left there, I use they, them pronouns, and I have been at AU for about two years as a teaching and learning specialist in CTRL. And I'll let my co-presenter introduce herself. Hi, uh, my name is Shed, like the thing in your backyard. I go by she or they prown pronouns. Wow, either is fine. And I've also been here, Mac and I started right at the same time um, and for two years, and I'm a teaching and learning specialist. All right, great. So let's uh, let's go ahead and get into it. We always like to start with um, some guidelines for participation so that you all know how to participate and uh, what's expected of you, and also so that we all have kind of a similar frame of reference for how to participate. Um, so throughout this workshop, we'll ask that you make yourself comfortable, um, stim, rock, fidget, knit, craft, whatever you need to do. Um, in order to be present, um, and you can participate in any sort of individual and group activities in a way that works for you, where you know yourself best and know what you're able to contribute today. We ask that if you have questions or have ideas or points that you'd like to share, you can either share them in the chat or feel free to raise your hand at any point. Um, you can raise your hand through that uh, reactions tab that you should see at the bottom of your screen. Um, it's a bit hard to see your physical hands raised, so either raising your hand uh, virtually or typing in the chat that you'd like to say something are the best ways to make sure that we know that uh, you would like to speak. Um, and then finally, uh, please do be generous with your knowledge and respectful for uh, of other folks' knowledge. And I'll note once again, since we had a few other people join, um, this session is recorded and we also share all of our materials, including the PowerPoint, any resources that we uh, mention, anything else that comes up during our conversation in an email afterwards. So don't feel like you need to take really extensive notes or anything like that. You'll get all of our slides. We do wanna start with a content warning for today. Um, so during this session, we'll discuss some student comments that can include harmful and microaggressive mes messages. These can include ideas which are racist, homophobic, transphobic, ableist, sexist, among any other sort of type of uh, negative comment that you might experience. We will certainly contextualize each instance of this language to illustrate how calling in can help mediate these moments. And we do invite you all to take breaks as necessary for your own well being. Feel free to turn off your camera if you have it on, uh, step away from the computer, whatever you need to do to prioritize your own well being. And I'll step back and have a little kind of meta moment here. So, the goal for this content warning and hopefully any other content warning that you would have in classes is not to have folks opt out. It's so that people can opt in and prepare themselves for any sort of upcoming discussion that might occur. It can be pretty jarring um, to hear or read something extremely offensive, just kind of out of the blue. Um, so we wanted to let you know kind of what you're quote unquote in for um, so that you can prepare yourself and take the time and space that you need. Um, and we encourage you, if you are having kind of a contentious conversation with students, that maybe a content warning would be helpful to them so that they know what to expect and also know how and when they can take breaks if they need to. So what we'll do now is kind of get into the content of our session today. And we always like to start with a warm up chat to get people going um, and ready to participate. So we'll ask you all to share, to introduce yourselves in the chat um, and share what concerns do you have when addressing challenging, and these can be ignorant or offensive or e maybe even uh, inflammatory comments made by students. So we know that you all probably have a lot of concerns, which is why you're here, which is great. Um, and we'd like to see what they are to make sure that we address them throughout our session today.
So we've got a couple folks getting in the chat here. Um, and you can also feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to speak uh, verbally. But we got some people worried about students not being receptive to responses. We don't want to make things worse or ignore problematic comments that we need to address. Um, we want to be prepared in case we hear comments from students. Um, that's great. It's it's always better to be prepared and proactive rather than reactive. And then we've got people who want to be wary of the of the folks who of the students who make those comments and we don't want to hurt the feelings or kind of alienate them from our classroom communities. But we also don't want to alienate the students that have heard those comments um, in the event that it, it was offensive or um, made the situation worse. And we don't want um, our students to have <laughs> to recognize that these comments are just kind of going to go unnoticed. So we also got people who are uh, worried about students um, uh, not wanting, worried that students may not be receptive to being told they're wrong or offensive. So we'll we'll definitely talk about a lot of these strategies here that can help, I think, address pretty much all of what you all brought up. So calling in is a really great technique um, that allows us to bring students back to the classroom community when someone strays from us. So it helps us give a it helps give us a framework that we can use to address these comments in a way that's both productive, but also doesn't let things fly by um, if something happens in class. So hopefully we're able to kind of address all of your your concerns and your um, and these worries that you all have. But at any point, if anybody has any questions or additional things to add, please do feel free to jump in. Um, we we love participation um, and we know that participation in workshops is a really great way to make sure that that information stays uh, relevant and stays with you as you move throughout the rest of your day. So to that end, um, we have some outcomes here for our workshop. So hopefully by the end of this workshop, you'll be able to distinguish calling in from calling out as strategies for approaching classroom comments. You'll be able to select specific strategies that you can use to handle disruptive comments that may occur uh, before those comments occur. So like uh, one person mentioned, they wanna be proactive in, in getting these strategies before things happen in class, as well as think, uh, what to do while that uh, particular conversation is occurring. And then also things that you can do after the conversation occurs um, so that you kind of cover all of your bases there. And then lastly, we'll also talk about the importance of calling in and reflecting on your own actions and missteps as an instructor as a way to both model to students how people can be called in and also recognize that none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. That's okay. That's part of learning for both us and our students. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Shed to talk about some research about belonging and responding before we get into the details of calling in as a technique itself. All right, thank you, Mac. So here is some research that we want to start with about belonging and responding. And while this is probably going to feel really familiar to us, but it's important to review anyway. So student belonging is tied to better academic performance, engagement, and motivation to learn. Of course, if students feel welcomed and comfortable, they're going to perform better in our classes. And minoritized students experience significantly lower levels of belonging across dimensions such as socioeconomic status status or class, race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, immigrant status, and religion. So students can experience, you know, will statistically experience less of that sense of belonging when they do not fit a more privileged or sort of quote unquote normative student experience. And a major factor in belonging is a respectful classroom environment. And that includes interrupting problematic statements about positionality or identity. Um, and little moments can add up. So little moments where we don't intervene can end up sending a pretty major message to our students. So not addressing and or deflecting problematic statements in class can affirm a biased belief, uh, or it can legitimize problematic statements. So not responding to a statement, not interrupting or re reorienting it or correcting it will send a message to our students that 
um, those statements are okay, that maybe even we implicitly agree with those statements. So that makes it especially important to speak up to protect our students' sense of belonging, especially our minoritized students. And so of course we wanna know at the end, it does not matter who is present to hear it. So if you have a class that is um, all men, for example, and someone makes a misogynistic comment, a comment that's offensive about women, it still is important to correct that comment. And I'd like to hear from you all in the chat or over video or audio. Why is that important? Why doesn't it matter who is physically in the room to hear the statement? What do we think? I think it's uh, setting the standards. If you allow it, you're then, if you allow it in a space, even if the other population is not there, then what you're saying is that that's permissible. Absolutely. Really beautifully said. Yeah. Is the, the, the belief is the problem, right? Not necessarily who's there to hear it. It's still a problem, even if the targeted group isn't present. So yeah, exactly. And then the chat, everyone needs to hear that the statement is harmful, right? Um, the people who are there are the ones who need to learn, right? Um, the people who said the thing are the ones who need to be called in. And we've got some other great comments like, yeah, it's not an inclusive curriculum. Absolutely. The silence creates assumption or agreement. Yeah, um, assumption of agreement. And, um, oh, I love this. Harmful statements made about anyone lends itself to harm harmful comments about anyone being accepted. Absolutely, beautifully said. And knowledge carries past the classroom, right? And eventually it will impact the targeted group in another space. So these are all excellent reasons why it's important to call in, even if the targeted group isn't there or doesn't seem to be there because we don't really know what people's identity is by looking at them. So there could be someone in class who is really deeply affected by it, but isn't comfortable sharing that. So we want to protect those folks as well. So here's what we want to distinguish between calling out and calling in. So I'm sure you're all familiar with some version of calling out which would be publicly pointing out that a person is doing something oppressive. Calling out is typically associated with putting people on the spot, um, you know, in front of others and telling them, you know, that they're wrong, that they need to change their behavior. What we want to instead encourage is calling in, a deliberately compassionate practice of pulling folks back in who have strayed from the group. And it starts from a positive assumption that people want to do well, they want to treat each other well, and they wanna learn. Um, another way to put this is loving each other enough to allow each other to make mistakes. Calling in as a concept, and especially as a pedagogical strategy, has a lot to owe to women of color feminisms, and uh, we've listed some authors who we really like discussing calling in on the side there. We encourage you to read more from them if you would like to, um, but I will ask you all, why is calling in a better strategy to start with than calling out? Why would we want to try to call in before having to resort to calling out? Because maybe sometimes we need to but why not start there? If you call someone out, it certainly can set up an argumentative or combative relationship. Uh, and if I understand calling in correctly, is that if I ask what the group thinks, that allows someone else to step in the space and give uh, a different point of view. And then it also starts to say, uh, well, we're it's peer-to-peer -peer learning as an opportunity. And then I can... Uh, amplify uh, a, a better statement uh, that's more inclusive. Absolutely. Again, beautifully explained that it offers an opportunity for that peer-to-peer -peer learning, which we know is the most powerful type of learning. Um, and then folks uh, are mentioning in the chat, if you're publicly humiliated, you're going to defend yourself, right? Not open yourself up to change. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I love this comment from Matt. It assumes the student made an honest mistake and is open to change. So, you know, it's a teachable moment, right? Um uh, transcends blame into growth. I love how you put that, Lindsay. It makes it a learning moment. And if no one can ever make mistakes and learn, what's the point of teaching, right? What's the point of education? So this is our opportunity to turn it into a learning moment. So exactly, these are all great reasons why we want to start with calling in and see how that, where that takes us. 
So we're going to use another framework to help us understand what we're calling in and how to respond to different moments with calling in. And this is from the Columbia Center for Teaching and Learning, and they call it hot moments, which breaks down into three types of moments in the classroom that might necessitate or will necessitate some type of calling in. We have heated moments, which we represent here with the flame, um, moments where it is clear something has gone wrong. So this is often characterized by accusations, name calling or yelling. Then we have offensive moments. We have the exclamation, exclamation point there, right? Like being stunned or shocked. Moments where someone has said something offensive such as a racist or ignorant joke, and it may or may not be acknowledged and it could turn into a heated moment depending on how we receive it or how others in the class receive it. And then we have tense moments, which we've represented here with a sort of knotted string or rope, moments where the room goes silent or students are uncomfortable. And this can be harder to identify than offensive or heated because heated moments, we can probably feel that things are getting really intense and escalating. In offensive moments, we can often tell when someone has said something that hurts another person deeply or dehumanizes them. A tense moment can be a little harder to locate. But our idea today is that we want to look at different strategies and understand what kind of moment would they be good for. So keep an eye out in our strategies segment for little icons in the corner of the screen that are going to indicate which type of moment we think that strategy works best for or will likely fit. Of course, every situation is going to be different. It's really going to depend on the context, which we're also going to talk about. But keep an eye out for whether a uh, strategy might be especially helpful for a heated, an offensive, a tense moment, or more than one of these types of moments. So here's where we get into that context. How can we tell if a student has made an earnest mistake or is trying to provoke a reaction? So this is important for informing our response. There are going to be some students who just want to start some sort of conflict or question authority in a certain way, or just sort of want to, um, you know, create a reaction among people. And then we have students who really do mean well and are not aware of the most sensitive or thoughtful language or phrasing, right? So I want to ask you all, how might context change how you perceive a student's comment? What kind of factors or what, what kind of context would you keep in mind when deciding how to respond? I think body language can certainly be an indicator if the student is looking at other students and looking around the room, gauging, you know, how much attention they have gave. Um, and then I also think that if that is behavior, then that's a perfect opportunity to call others in. Mm. That, so yeah, body language, absolutely. I would keep in mind, you know, everyone has a different way of comporting themselves physically. Um, but if you, if someone is looking at other people while making a statement, that's quite pointed, right? That's something we want to keep in mind. We have tone of voice, definitely. Sometimes if it's phrased as a question, it can mean they're trying to learn. Absolutely. Yeah. Although not always, sometimes a person might ask a question to establish, you know, that they're right. But uh, absolutely, Matt, sometimes it can tell us that the person is curious and maybe they're hesitating with their language because they're not sure how to be respectful. What are some other contexts that we might want to keep in mind? We've got body language, tone of voice, whether it's a question or a statement. Previous experiences with that student, um, what is their tendencies in class and in conversations? Absolutely. Patterns of behavior. If a student is unlikely to um, speak sensitively in class, we might want to keep that in mind because our other students might be really feeling the effects of that pattern. Great. Yeah. Does the comment di relate directly to the topic being discussed? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If it's out of left field, that's definitely something that we want to, we want to be really specific in how we address it. So I'll move us to our next slide and let's look at some of these other factors. We have things like the course sequence or level, right? How, how deep are students in the major or the program? Um, or are they new to the to the discipline? Student identity, instructor identity, and you know, the role that our identity plays in how we perceive student comments. 
patterns of behavior, as we mentioned, the discipline and the topic, I will say I teach sociology and part of the class is learning to be more thoughtful and aware with that type of language. So that's very fitting with my class. The lesson focus, right, the topic, the size of the class itself, and the timing of the comment we can also keep in mind. For example, making a mistake at the beginning of the semester versus continuing to say a hurtful thing past the beginning of the semester, past opportunities we've given them to improve. Uh, Mac, is there anything you would add here? Okay, excellent. All right, great. So with all of that background, let's move into actually talking about calling in, right, and how we approach these conversations and how you might use calling in in some of your classrooms. Um, so we have a lot of strategies. If you've been to our workshops before, we like to share a lot of strategies because we know that specific strategies don't always work for everyone. Um, so feel free, you know, we're not suggesting that you use every single strategy that we that we uh, provide you with here or that we share here. Um, but really giving you a lot of different options so that you can choose the ones that work best with your own teaching practice um, and with your own students. And even if you're not a teacher, um, a lot of these strategies can be applicable outside of the classroom and when we're talking to colleagues or when we're talking to other folks that we work with. So overall, how do we approach um, conversations on contentious topics, right? So one of the things that we encourage people to do is to emphasize to students or the people that you're talking with curiosity, exploration, listening, reflection, dialogue, understanding, and respect, as opposed to agreement or winning. So a lot of times when we speak or when students speak, um, they think they kind of need to quote unquote, win the conversation, right? Or they're, they're there to prove that they are correct and that they're saying the exact right thing um, or that they're saying the right thing to get the professor's approval or the approval of other folks in class. Um, however, a lot of times when we have conversations about contentious topics, there may not even be a right answer, right? So there, there may just be the idea that we want to explore different viewpoints and different ways that things could be taken and analyzed. So we want to encourage students that it's more important to think about understanding other people's perspectives than necessarily getting to some sort of resolution or some sort of correct answer. Um, it's also important to think about uh, encouraging students or, or peers to occupy multiple perspectives on the same issue, right? So it's important to think about not only your own perspective and your own background and how that affects how you think about things, but also other people's perspectives. And um, this encourages students to think critically. Um, and it may even be easier with students who are a little bit reluctant to discuss where they can take someone else's perspective, right? They're not necessarily arguing or discussing their own viewpoint. They're discussing a perspective that isn't their own and doesn't necessarily reflect back on them. So that might make it a little bit easier to start some of these conversations so that students don't feel like, okay, anything that I say is going to be taken as if I am saying it and that's my opinion. And then finally, uh, we want to note and recognize and share with our students that collegial dialogue is a disciplinary skill and a scholarly practice, regardless of discipline. So Shed mentioned that uh, she teaches in sociology. I am a biologist. I work in with viruses. Um, but still, having uh, collegial dialogue with peers and other, other folks in the discipline is a skill that we're all going to need to use. Um, and allowing students the opportunity to practice this and recognizing, again, that they can make mistakes um, is really important to share with them as we start having these conversations. So that leads really nicely into a bunch of strategies that we have for setting the stage. So what do we do before these conversations? And so we want to share with our students our goals for the conversation. I would say sharing goals for anything that you do in class um, is really important so that students know what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to participate and engage, but especially for conversations like this where students may think that they are supposed to argue a particular point. Maybe that is the goal for your discussion, but it's important that students know what that goal is. So developing those goals either alone or in conjunction with students can be really helpful. Regardless, you should definitely share those goals with students um, so that they know, again, how to, how to participate and engage. Additionally, it's, it's always helpful, and I think we mentioned this in pretty much every workshop that we do, regardless of the topic, um, that developing classroom norms and guidelines is key to any classroom or any kind of inclusive environment, right? This lets folks know what and how to participate, what is expected of them, 
um, what things may warrant an intervention or a pause in the conversation. And it lets everyone get on the same page about how to interact in the classroom. We encourage you to co-create uh, norms with your students and we can share a resource with you about how to do so. Um, and we also have those guidelines that we shared at the beginning of our session today um, that you all can pull from, because uh, I think a lot of those are relevant regardless of the type of uh, situation that you're in. You might consider including a syllabus statement on respectful dialogue, and then the next slide will have a few example statements that uh, you could potentially use. And then finally, we encourage you to both make boundaries clear and plan for those challenging comments, right? So we, we had a few people mention that they are here in order to help them plan for those challenging comments. Um, but if we just go into our classrooms and don't have any plan for when something happens, then we don't have any plan for when something happens, right? We don't know what to do, and it becomes a very uh, difficult instance to try and address. So I, like I mentioned, I teach science and biology courses, and I recently had a conversation with my students on the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccine mandates. Um, so before we had that conversation, uh, I reminded them of our classroom guidelines. So I showed a slide and said, is there anything else anybody would like to add at this point? No one had anything to add, but that's okay. Um, but it reminds them, this is how we're gonna interact in this space. And I also um, plan for some of the challenging comments that my students could have said. So these were non-majors, people who hadn't been in biology courses before. So I was worried, well, you know, maybe someone might say that vaccines don't work or that they cause autism, so they shouldn't be mandated, or even that there might be some trauma um, and a lot of emotions around discussing the pandemic in an academic environment, recognizing that we're all living through and continuing to live through that pandemic. So having those in mind and recognizing that those things might come up allowed me to feel more prepared and prep for how I might address particular comments that come up. Now, recognizing that we can't always address everything and we can't always prepare for everything that our students might say, um, but at least thinking about some of those topics that might come up can be really helpful in helping you feel a little bit more prepared. Um, so I want to ask, uh, is there anything else that you all have done to help you prepare for discussions on contentious topics? Uh, with my students, I had to had to have a conversation about harassment, and uh, as part of the prep for that, we also talked about what might be possible causes for, uh, of harassment, so that people could have an understanding, could have more empathy, and, and keep a humanistic perspective as we get into the conversation. That's great, thanks, Michael. And that also brings in some of those additional perspectives that might be helpful to add to the background for our students, so that they're not just drawing again on their own experiences. So everybody has experiences, but everybody else also has experiences. All right, so I promised you all some uh, specific syllabus language for respectful statements. Um, so we have two here. One is from. Shed, I believe you wrote this. You use this in your class? Yeah. So this is for a sociology course. Um, and I'll just read this off uh, specifically for accessibility. Um, so this course is heavily reliant on dialogues between and among class members. Occasionally, we will be dealing with controversial topics about which individuals may have strong and differing opinions. Therefore, it is crucial that we work together to cultivate a respectful classroom space in which everyone can share their reactions and analyses comfortably. This means being considerate and patient with everyone else in the room. Verbal bullying and personal attacks will not be tolerated under any circumstances. So that's setting those boundaries that are really important and also sharing with students the value of having these particular conversations in a sociology course. The second one is um, from one of the classes that I've taught. So uh, this reads, so this might be more relevant for some STEM subjects or subjects where contentious topics are not typically discussed or where students have less experience discussing them. So what I say is as the scientific knowledge background of those in the course is varied, please be respectful of different knowledge levels. All students, regardless of perceived knowledge in science are encouraged to participate and voice their thoughts and opinions. Some of the topics that we discuss may be controversial and opinions on all sides are welcome, but they need to be supported by reputable sources and facts. Please be respectful of those with opinions different from yours. 
So here I'm sharing that it's not just okay to share your opinions, but they need to be able to be backed up, right? Sometimes opinions are okay, but sometimes the things that we say need to be backed up by sources and facts, which is a key disciplinary skill for my discipline of biology and probably for most people's disciplines, facts are, facts are important. Um, so those are some of the things that we can do before we have a, a particular conversation, but let's move into strategies that we can use when a challenging comment is made in class. Um, so we have five kind of groupings of uh, strategies that you can use. So one is the pause. We can clarify and redirect comments. We can think about context. We can use the kind of group effort um, that we were talking about a little bit previously. And then also we can communicate hurt. And like Shed mentioned, uh, we're going to try to highlight the type of comment that the strategy is relevant for. So a heated, offensive, or tense one. Again, recognizing that none of these are rules um, and that many of these strategies are likely to be helpful regardless of the situation. So the first one to bring up, which we think is good for basically any instance that you might have is the pause. So what this, uh, as you might expect from the name, it is pausing, right? And so pausing suggests to us that as instructors, we don't have to have a thought out response to each challenging comment as soon as it occurs. These comments by their, um, <clears throat> excuse me, by, by their nature are really difficult to discuss and address. And depending on who says the comment, as well as your own identities as an instructor, they could be really hurtful to you and not just your students. Um, so as you hear these strategies and as we talk through, uh, keep your own health and mental well-being in mind and select those strategies that you feel you could use in your own classroom. That being said, like we mentioned, um, we can pause and we can maybe even return to a conversation later, but it is important to acknowledge and return to that conversation once you are more prepared. So how do we actually implement the pause? Um, one really easy way is just to take a few breaths or a sip of water before responding to a student's comment. We could also think about giving the entire class a five to 10 minute break and then return together to discuss or say, you know, hey, we don't feel prepared to, or I don't feel prepared to address this comment right now, and I think we need to take a little bit more time, and we'll return to it the next class session with either more information or more preparation. And any of these three um, strategies are, are appropriate to use um, in kind of a heated, offensive, or a tense moment, again, recognizing that regardless of what type of moment is occurring, it is important to always return to that conversation. If you need to take some time, that's okay, but you do need to return to it at some point. Another strategy um, that you can use specifically during, and here we're gonna share with you a lot of different sentence stems that you can use, um, is using the strategy of clarifying and redirecting students' comments. So we can ask for clarification specifically. We can ask, what do you mean? We can ask, how do you see that connecting to the topic that we're discussing? And that connecting question brings us back to our goals of the discussion and reminds students, you know, here's what we're supposed to be talking about. And maybe they've strayed a little bit from what we were uh, meant to be talking about. We can also um, have the statement, keeping respectful practice or a classroom guideline in mind. Um, can you tell me more about that? And that prompts them to remember those classroom guidelines and that maybe they're straying a little bit away from where those classroom guidelines uh, say that we should be. We can also um, repeat back to our students what they said. We can paraphrase their comments and ask, is this an accurate summary of what you were conveying? Um, a lot of times, especially when we have learners, they are still learning, right? So they may not realize uh, exactly what they said or how it was taken. So this strategy offers students a chance for self-reflection. While we state that this strategy is great for heated, offensive, and tense moments, I want to give a little bit caution about a heated moment where you may not necessarily want to repeat back what a student said. So for example, if someone said, you know, quote, all disabled people on disability are leeching on government handouts, I wouldn't necessarily repeat that back to them and say, is this what you meant? Um, instead, we might think about a different strategy, such as communicating hurt, which we'll get to later. Um, we can also ask our speakers to reflect, um, which can encourage perspective taking. Um, so what do we think a particular group might say about that? Or I understand what you're saying, but I'm also thinking about how a particular group might find that assumption hurtful. And that allows us to draw on the fact that we may not have the identities of a person that's um, that a comment is uh, 
referencing, but we can still rely on the li lived experience or what we know people in those groups might say. Finally, with this clarification and directing redirection portion, um, we can also think about helping with reverting and potentially pulling out the positive intentions of comments. So we could say, I think I might know what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, or I would encourage you to use other words and then state those other words that students should use. This particular strategy gives more guidance to the student than just acting them ask, asking them to reflect. So it might be more helpful in some of those heated or offensive moments as those students might need more direction if they're saying something particularly offensive or heated. But again, it, it really a lot of times, and unfortunately, which is what's difficult about this particular topic is that it depends on the context there. Um, but this gives you some ideas for what you can use in different uh, contexts here. So speaking of context, um, I'm going to hand it over to Shed to talk about how we could use context to help us address these comments. All right. So uh, the first strategy that we can use here is focusing on ideas, not individuals. So let's say a student uses the word handicapped in class um, and or maybe multiple students do but um, you address it in the next class, you don't wanna say, you know, oh, you know, this guy over here said this offensive thing, right? Instead, we want to offer the opportunity for it to be a learning moment for everyone. So we can say last class, the word handicap date came up during our discussion. And I want us to address why we want to use other wording. So the emphasis on we, right? The collective learning opportunity, because maybe folks like use that language without thinking about it, without realizing it, right? So turning that into a collective learning moment. Now, additionally, as Mac was saying, we want to consider the context of the statement or the comment. And like we said earlier, things like, does the comment seem well-intentioned? Um, are they trying to learn? Are they asking a question? Are they saying something where maybe they agree with what you're saying, but the way they phrase it comes off clunky or hurtful? Um, or is the student using inflammatory language, right? Are they saying something where it's clear they're trying to be provocative or to hurt others' feelings? Um, yeah, so we noted that as being good for tense moments. Consider previous patterns of students' behavior. So we already mentioned, right, um, if a student has a pattern of perhaps making thoughtful statements but struggling to articulate them with the most sensitive language, then we can help the student, right, orient them towards more thoughtful language. If the student has a pattern of provocative statements or um, you know, not really being conscientious of hurting others' feelings or even intending to hurt other feelings, others' feelings, we definitely want to respond in a more pointed way to that than assuming that they mean well. And if appropriate, you can move on from one of these moments with a reminder about respectful practice. So maybe a side comment is said, or maybe, you know, it's a rather minor statement, but you want to remind students that you have those classroom guidelines, you have a syllabus statement, you have whatever those tools are to fall back on that reinforce respectful behavior. So you can say to your students, let's just remember to keep our class guidelines in mind or the fact that, you know, we have to be respectful to one another in mind to, is the sort of more minor move that we can use. Now, we mentioned already uh, making it about group learning. So to reinforce this, we wanna emphasize these moments as a community learning opportunity. So again, maybe one student says something mistakenly, but we can turn it into a moment for everyone to learn by saying, we should be careful about using certain terms and then explaining it, discussing it with them. Why is it important to use this language? Why might it be hurtful, right? So it's something we work on, or can we try to be more careful with our words around on this issue. And then it's something that everyone is committing to, right? They all have a stake in. Now, again, referring to community agreements shows that it's not a conflict between student and instructor or students and instructor. We really don't want it to become a moment of a back and forth between two or a couple people. We wanna make it about accountability to everyone. So saying something like, speaking like this breaks our discussion agreement. Now I, as the instructor might feel frustrated and might wanna say, you hurt my feelings or I'm annoyed by this, but bringing it back to that scholarly and collegial behavior and dialogue 
we can say this violates our classroom agreement, right? That we all agreed to, or I think you should consider how your words impact your classmates. So it's not necessarily that what they did feels wrong or hurtful to you, but that it is not respectful of everyone in the class. Of course, we wanna remind students of who is present. Let's remember that we don't know what people are bringing with them to class. Um, a student may think, oh, well, you know, there's no trans people in here, so I can say whatever I want. No, we don't know that, right? Um, there's no way that you could identify those details of a person's identity just from looking at them or being in class with them. And so we imagine that whoever you're talking about is in the class with you right now and see how that influences how you talk about it. And it should lead you to be respectful when speaking about that group. And then if appropriate, turn the issue over to the class. So this is a one that we want to be really careful with, you'll notice we didn't put this on for, we didn't put the heated logo on this one because we are, we want to be careful of not uh, inciting a sort of a, a big explosion, right? Or a lot of like, you know, disagreement among everyone. But for offensive and tense moments, it could be appropriate to turn the issue over to other students and let them teach one another in that peer-to-peer -peer learning moment. So what are our thoughts on that statement? Or keeping in mind our community agreement. Does someone want to share their perspective? In my experience doing this, Almost always a student will say what I wanted to say to call in the student, but it'll be more powerful because a fellow peer did it for them. Can I jump in real quick? Jen? Yes, please. Um, so one thing to note here with this, uh, turning it over to the class, is making sure that we're saying what are our thoughts on that statement or that idea as opposed to what Shed said. Right. So that puts it back on the idea as opposed to the person and can help, again, make it about community learning. Um, and so that we're not arguing about people, we're arguing about statements or ideas. That's such a good point, Mac, right? Like we don't want to say, oh, like who disagrees with Jeff? <laughs> you know, we want to say, what do we think about that? And then that lets other people share their perspectives on that issue. I love that point. And then this is a more escalated strategy that you might have to use if other strategies don't work first or if this is a pattern. And that's communicating hurt and insult. And to be very clear and honest about it, um, so we want to avoid, you know, no, you're saying you hate disabled people and don't want us on campus, right? The yes statement, what we want to do to communicate hurt and insult would be to say something like, I was hurt when you said that we should not prioritize access for disabled people on AU's campus. Everyone has a right to get into the buildings on campus, and we should not gatekeep access, knowledge, and connections for disabled people simply because they cannot walk or get inside a building. So for heated and offensive moments, it might be necessary to just communicate clearly that something was hurtful and to be really honest and clear about that. So a couple other, a sort of basic sentence structure would be, I was hurt when you said blank because blank, to explain how that might feel denigrating or dehumanizing or offensive. We want to make sure to use I statements so that, right, we're, we're being very direct and explain why the statement, statement is hurtful and inconsiderate so that people understand why their behavior led to this consequence. And if all else fails, you can ask someone to leave class. Um, I know this is something that instructors might be worried about. I have to say it's not something that happens that often, thankfully. It's good to be prepared for, but I would really think of it as an escalated measure if all of your other calling in strategies do not work with the person. If it feels like things stop being productive and that real harm is being done to people in class and the person who's perpetrating it is not interrupting or correcting their behavior, that would be a moment to ask someone to leave class. And that is its own process that we can also think about if that's something that we want to get into. Um, but I want us to keep in mind, calling in is supposed to help us avoid those moments if possible. So to make an important distinction here, disagreement is not wrong, not at all. Making hurtful comments is. So we expect our students to disagree. We expect them to have discussions and to have different perspectives. That's really beautiful. And that's going to help them learn from one another. 
but being disrespectful is where we draw the line. So students are absolutely welcome to disagree with one another and to share their perspectives as long as it's respectful. When a person begins to make dehumanizing, offensive, denigrating comments, and they're not listening to their peers, they're not taking the opportunity to correct or rephrase, that is when we would draw a line and say, no, that's what's not acceptable, not the disagreement. So a little reminder here, um, something we hear a lot is folks will say, well, I'm not part of that group. How can I call someone in when I don't even have the experience they're talking about, right? So perhaps you hear something that is homophobic, but you don't identify as queer or within the LGBTQ plus umbrella. Um, what we want to say is you don't have to have that experience to intervene and call someone in. The first thing you can do is honor lived experience. So you could say, you know, I do not have experience identifying as queer or LGBTQ in any way. But if we listen to folks who tell us about that experience, they make it very clear that that type of language or behavior is hurtful. So honoring, really listening to what people have told us about how they want to be treated and spoken about. The other is to utilize empathy. So to say, you know, I don't have that experience, but I think if I did, I would be really hurt by that. And encouraging empathy among our students when they make statements, kind of like how we say, imagine the person is in the room with you. So you don't have to have that experience to interrupt hurtful behavior regarding it. So I think here we're going to pause and see if anyone has questions or things that they'd like to bring up. Um, now we have a, a case study to discuss and we know that a lot of times people don't like breakout rooms but a lot of people really enjoy breakout rooms um, so we want what we want to do here is ask you all what you would prefer would you prefer to talk about um, a case study about where a student makes an ignorant comment in small groups as a breakout room discussion or would you prefer to do that as a larger group kind of full full everybody in discussion and you can just uh you can either say it out loud or put in the chat breakout room or um group discussion Mm -hmm. All right. So people are, this is, this is what we assumed. Um, so, right. so we'll stay together for this. Um, so I will skip that slide and we will prompt you all, um, to basically read the case study. Um, there's a few questions, uh, that we have for you all to, to think about as you're reading it. We'll give you about four or five minutes to read that. And then we'll come back together and start to discuss some of those questions that are on that slide. So I'll put this case study here and then um, Shed, if you could copy it into the chat in case anybody can't access the PowerPoint slides, uh, that would be ideal.
All right, take about 15 seconds to wrap up whatever thought you're having, or uh, if you're writing something down to wrap that up, and then we'll come back together. All right, so let's let's start. We can start with any of these questions, or we can start with: um, Has anybody experienced something like this before, and how did it make you feel? How did it make you and your students feel? Yeah, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, so um, when I was in law school, I had uh, as a student, I experienced this in. We had a class on payday loans and the impact of payday loan establishments on communities. And it was very similar situation, right? Where it definitely affects uh, minorities, minoritized communities and um, low socioeconomic communities much more than anyone else, right? And the I was in my thirties in law school and the student who responded first to the question was someone who had gone straight through college into law school 22 years old, had never had a job, never paid her own bills, was a member of my small group in law school. So I actually knew her as a person. And she made a very similar comments to this. And I grew up without many resources, went to college on an academic scholarship and whatnot. And so personally, like had a reaction to this. But I also benefited from the fact that I was in my 30s and had worked and whatnot. And because I knew her, and so after the class, I didn't react in the classroom, but I did have a conversation with her after the, the large group session about, to be frank, her economic entitlement and her lack of awareness about other people's situations. And I felt comfortable having that conversation because I had a relationship with her. But um, it was it was jarring to hear the comment in the classroom. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Laura. Um... If you don't mind me asking a follow up question, how did how did she take the the conversation that you had? I mean, I think I I she hand, I thought she uh, accepted it or engaged with me quite well. I mean, I was tried to be really sort of compassionate about it in the sense and like acknowledging what I knew about her. Like these are things that that I know about you that you shared, you know, and that I'm not surprised in a sense that you would have that you would respond that way because you you don't have an awareness. Um, and what I said to her more generally, as I said, you know, in thinking about being a lawyer in our country and in thinking about representing a wide diversity of, of potential clients and or working on policy matters, you know, it's gonna be even more important um, that she builds awareness about areas of just like social problems that she doesn't have experience around in order to be good at her job. Yeah, that's great. So tying it back into, you know, what what you know about a person, feeling comfortable bringing something up to a person who, you know, recognizing like this, this was a student that and maybe in, I mean, we wrote this case study, so I don't know the background of Aziza because we didn't think that far. Um, but maybe something similar happened here, right, where a student just has never encountered um these uh, topics before. They've never thought about it and they need someone to help them think about it and call them in and say, hey, you know, we, this isn't, um, there's there's a lot more things that we can bring up and there's a lot more questions to be asked. Um, so I think uh, I'll, I'll move to the chat. So we have Jane mentioning uh, being a big fan of the Socratic method. So uh, their thought would be to start by asking the whole class to answer the question. So why might people not be able to move, right? So what factors might help keep people in a particular situation? So I think that kind of aligns with what Laura was saying about bringing that up to students that there are things outside of their control or things that they're maybe not recognizing or that they don't understand that they need to keep in, in mind. And we can uh, throw that back to the other students in our class so that they um, can help us bring up what some of those factors might be. We also have Luis uh, mentioning that we could respond with a repetition of the question, hoping that students would mention issues like access and roots. So similar to, I think, what Jean said.
And then Jane also mentioning that we might uh, also dig into additional factors like why uh, things were created in particular communities as opposed to more affluent uh, communities and, and bringing in our backgrounds uh, to address particular comments that students make. So that's always great. Uh, st I think students really appreciate when we bring in our own backgrounds to help them understand and our own lived experience to help them understand how they can um, other things that they maybe didn't think about. What other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead, Luis. Hi. So I was wondering, you know, trying to visualize this particular example and thinking that, you know, a student from our perspective could be so clueless as to make that kind of comment. And then I'm worried about the reactions by other students who might laugh at this person, right? Because everyone has their own experiences and, you know, that person might not be aware of issues like access, et cetera. So I was wondering if there is any research or you have any opinions about being preemptive instead of reactive and giving sort of like a model of a conflicting situation at the beginning of the semester and what we kind of expect from students on like not to laugh at others. Because sometimes what I feel is, I'm sorry for the background noise, by the way. Yeah. Um, what I, sometimes I feel like our language is too general for students. And if we don't exemplify it, maybe it doesn't resonate or connect that well. I don't know what you think about, you know, because maybe being preemptive is not a good idea either. I, oh, sorry. Um, I I like that preemptive idea. I think it really ties in with like setting classroom guidelines and exactly to your point about the sort of like broadness students, whenever I ask them to make guidelines, they will always say like, be kind, be respectful. And I'll say, okay, but what does that mean? You know, and prompt them to be more specific about the behavior. So they will say like, you know, like, you know, I, disagreement is okay. So I'll say, what does that mean? Like, how do we react when we disagree? And yeah. I even ask them, how will you respond if someone says something that you find hurtful? How will we compassionately, um, how will we compassionately like call the person in and ask them to be specific? So I think absolutely like emphasizing with them, like we may disagree, but let's try not to, you know, let's try to be understanding. Let's see it from each other's perspective. Uh, what do you think, Mac? I saw Luis, you, you unmuted again. So I want to give you a chance to speak. No, no, no. I was just uh, nodding and saying, right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ed. Yeah, no, that and what you said, Shed, is exactly what I was thinking, right? So giving specific uh, ways to interact in the classroom, such as, I mean, one community guideline could be, you know, we we recognize other people have different experiences and we won't, uh, I don't know if you'd want to explicitly say we won't laugh when someone makes an ignorant comment, um, but I think, you know, that could be a part of a discussion, right? So what if someone laughs when someone says, uh, in, an ignorant or an offensive comment. How do we address that in class? I want to also add here. Um, so I grew up very privileged and I don't think I really understood. Like I may have been a person who would ask that question at some point. I, I hope I wouldn't, but I, I might have. And so I think what I might try to do um, to, you know, like uh, Laura talked about sharing like her experience with the group. And I might do the same and say, you know, I would have that question too, and sort of understand where they're coming from and say, you know, um, you know, I, I've thought the same thing in the past. And then when I, you know, and then share, you know, how I came to understand that that's not possible for people after other students share their perspective. So I think you could also sort of, if it's appropriate, empathize with why they feel that confusion about the issue. That's a great point, Shed. Um, are there any other, what other thoughts do we have about this? Any other specific uh, strategies that you think might be most useful or how might you, um, you know, are there are there consequences that are needed in this situation or maybe there aren't consequences?
Right, and we got another chat message from Jane. So appreciate you all uh, participating in the way that that works for you. Like we we really do appreciate that, and we mean that when we say that. So just want to highlight that there. Um, but Jane says, I always start from the assumption that the person truly doesn't understand the deeper layers of their question and the privilege under it. The issue for me is if they dig in or deflect. Sometimes I have to ask the student to further discuss it after class if they are dominating dominating the conversation or if the class has gone off the rails. And I think that's a really good thing to keep in mind that sometimes, um, you know, if this is a if this is a one off situation or if it's a situation where you think it's maybe only one student that has these perspectives, it can sometimes be appropriate to move the conversation to a different avenue. Um, that being said, what or and this is this is speaking from my own background in a in a science kind of classroom. A lot of times, I find that if one student has a misconception, a lot of them do. Um, so exploring that further as a class, I think, can be really helpful uh, because, you know, the one student that says the thing is typically not the only student that has that perspective or maybe may have that question. Um, but that's, again, another one of those context instances where sometimes we do need to move it outside of the class or even return to it in a future class session. And then uh, Matt mentioning uh, that uh, they think this was a an honest question and a learning moment and that there wouldn't necessarily be consequences needed here. And I think that's completely appropriate. Um, I also would not impose any sort of consequences here, but it's always helpful to keep in mind what those consequences might be or what those responses might be, because sometimes students do need consequences for the things that they say. Um, so we just want to keep in mind that that sometimes we do need consequences. Um, and it's helpful to to talk about and think about what those are either individually or as a group with your whole class. All right, I'm gonna leave it uh, just a little bit more time in case anybody has anything else to say. Uh, Laura mentioning that some, some consequences happen naturally. So the way in which their relationships with others in the class are impacted, um, that's a great thing to recognize that, uh, you know, saying things have, have consequences, right? Regardless of what we say. And even if it is an honest mistake, Sometimes there are consequences in the ways that we're able to interact with other students or other um, learners in our classrooms. All right, well, thank you all for uh, discussing this with us. Hopefully this gave you some ideas about how you might address uh, comments as they come up in your own classes. Obviously this is one particular instance, but I think this kind of idea of a student making an ignorant comment is, is pretty common in most of our classes. Um, so now I'll I'll hand it back to Shed, I think, to to finish up with just a few more thoughts um, before we before we end our session today. Thank you, Mac. So let's think about what we do after one of these moments, um, and whether we planned for it or not, maybe it just happened. And so um, we really want to gear it towards reflection for student and instructor. So here are some strategies that we can use. So you can engage students asynchronously by reaching out to them after class. We don't always know what we, you know, we think is a the best thing to say during class or during one of these hot moments. Um, but after class, we might reach out and say something about, you know, what happened or acknowledge it, um, or specifically reaching out to those who are engaged in, you know, being called in um, and maybe say, hey, let's talk during office hours. Let's talk after class. Um, so anything along those lines. Um, it's really important, especially if things get really um, uh, uncomfortable in whatever sort of heated, offensive, or tense moment, to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a student or students who have said something to escalate the situation in the classroom or have behaved in a harmful way, and to be really clear with them about what happened, what went wrong, um, you know, hear from them about perhaps what their perspective is, depending on how things went down, and to be clear with them about how you expect them to behave in class going forward so that this will not happen again. So really following up. You can also start class after one of these moments with a reflective pause. You may even ask students, what could have been different about our previous class session to make it more 
um, to make it lead not to one of these moments, right? To have it be more respectful. Um, how will the class proceed in this and future discussions? You may even go back to your discussion guidelines and revise them or revisit them. You can consider reviewing or adapting the class contract, like we just said, or guidelines or agreement, whatever it might look like. Maybe you missed something that now you want to add after this moment has happened. And then, of course, self-reflection for us as instructors. So it might happen that you will have to accept responsibility, if necessary, for a moment that you perpetuated without meaning to, right? Uh, a mistake that you made. Um, did you say or do something that contributed to or caused the discomfort? Did you skip over intervening because you weren't sure what to do or you didn't realize in the moment that it was hurtful? Um, and then think about how can you rebuild connections with students? So taking accountability, you know, I should have addressed a comment or I should have corrected that person when they misgendered or said something offensive. Um, and think about, you know, how can you, earn trust back with your students um, and in sort of the community of the class. And it's really important for us to open ourselves up to being called in by students because we're asking them, right, to be receptive to that. So we have to be receptive to it too. We want to model that behavior for students. So, right, it, like inviting students to share their feedback, to give their take on something, um, to correct you sometimes, um, that can be really powerful. And when they do, to accept it graciously and really think about it, you know, thank you, you know, thank you for correcting me or thank you for making that suggestion. I'm really going to think about it and integrate it into my teaching. And you can even provide an anonymous doc or form where students can submit or share, you know, something that stuck out to them, a suggestion they have for you. You know, they can anonymously say, you know, I was kind of uncomfortable with that moment. And then you can learn from it and uh, adapt that into your teaching. And then, of course, reflecting on the discussion itself in which one of these moments happened. So asking what went well what didn't go well? Could different preparation have changed how the conversation went? For example, reminding students about guidelines, could that have helped? And what would you change for future discussions so that we can learn from it? Um, a little note here is about being proactive versus reactive. So the earlier, the better. Instead of hoping that these moments won't happen and then reacting in the moment, which I think you all recognize because you're all here, we want to be prepared. So it could be feel awkward to say something like, do you mind explaining that? But if you practice it, you get better at it. And it's easier to say to a student, you know, can you explain why you said that? Or what do we all think of that? Right. And it's very important to document concerns and, and interactions. If you have to, you know, call in, you might want to document that, especially if you meet with students to talk about it. Send an email after that says, thank you for meeting with me today. And that recaps what your conversation was. So it's really important to be prepared for these moments and not have to do, that prevents us from having to do a lot of reaction and figuring it out after someone has been hurt. Um, I do want to acknowledge our question here, but maybe we can wrap up our slides first. Mac, what do we think? This is a good question. Yeah, we just we just have a couple more resources. Um, so a few resources to share with you all that there is the Office of the Dean of Students that you can go to if you need additional help. Of course, CTRL, uh, we at CTRL love talk. Well, I don't know that we love talking about having difficult conversations, but we're really uh, we're we're happy to to help out and help you map conversations or think about how you might address or um, frame conversations. Um, there's also the Office of Student Accountability and Restorative Practices that has uh, a few different tools that they can use in case students do stray too far from the conversation or too far from the class and the group. Um, and they can be helpful in uh, reaching out to and addressing those particular comments that students make if they are resistant to uh, being called in. And then there's also the care reports that the university offers. Um, so with that, we'll we'll get to, um, I think, Michael's question of any advice on following up with students that got hurt without creating my trauma. Um, could you... Do you mean without creating like additional trauma or without like address, uh, creating more trauma? No, for sorry, yourself? Uh, creating more trauma. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, go ahead, Chad. 
So you um, so I, I have, to, I unmuted and I have talky face. Um, so my thought here would be to invite them to follow up with you, but not to press them on it. So like, it's really, it would be, I think, necessary to follow up with someone who did create harm. But if someone who's been harmed, I think you can invite them to continue the conversation, but they don't necessarily have to follow up because, you know, having to relive it might be traumatizing for them, but they might take you up on it. And in that case, I would really focus on questions and taking accountability. So, you know, how are you doing? How was that experience for you? And let them share what they feel comfortable sharing. And ask, like, what can I do? Asking, what can I do to, um, you know, support you right now? Or what can I do and or what can I do in future classes to prevent this from happening? And, and listen to what they have to say. Mac, what would you say here? So I'll add, um, this actually happened to me when I was a student. Something happened and uh, my instructor couldn't follow up in the moment with me, but followed up afterwards. Um, and I just, I got an email from her and she was like, I noticed this happened. I want to open up the space in case you'd like to talk anymore. I want you to know that I support you and all of these other kind of um, comments like that. And that... Um, was the first time something like that had ever happened where an instructor reached out to me specifically about a comment that was made in class. And I'll say from my own perspective, that was extremely helpful. I did not follow up with her. I just said, thank you so much for the email. I appreciate your support. Um, but just acknowledging that you think that this comment could have specifically uh, affected a particular student and recognizing that, um, that in and of itself is really powerful, but I really like what Shed said about offering that space, but not requiring it. So it's like, I'm here, I'm ready to to help out or discuss further if you'd like to, but you are certainly not required to. Do any, Does anybody else have thoughts about uh, how to follow up? All right. So with that, I think we're at the end of our time here. Um, so we'd love if you all could fill out uh, this feedback survey so that we can improve our offerings for you all in the future. Um, like we said, we're going to uh, share all of these resources. Um, can go to our final slide. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll share a bunch of resources with you all in that follow up email. Um, we appreciate you taking this time out of your Friday afternoon to, to chat with us and hope that uh, these resources are helpful to you as you navigate having, um, as you navigate calling folks in. And I think Shed and I can hang back um, if you, if anybody has any questions or anything that they didn't want to bring up in front of the, the whole group. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.